description of classical Stoicism. And now we're going to talk about the resurgence of Stoicism, modern Stoicism, and misappropriations of Stoicism. That sound cool? Optime. <laughs> Benny, Benny, Benny. So the resurgence of Stoicism. Um, back in its heyday, um, it was pretty well distributed throughout the Mediterranean. Uh, there were Stoics essentially on any coast that you could imagine. Uh, usually they were kind of um, sheltered away because uh, believe it or not, a lot of people didn't like monotheism, but such is life. Um, as Christianity gained ground in the second, third, fourth, and fifth of the centuries, a CE. Um, parallels were made between Stoicism and Christianity. A lot of um, the similar ideals on ethics were kind of made. And a couple of fictional letters were written between um, Seneca the Younger and like St. Paul, Peter. Um, it's almost impossible for them to have existed. That's how we know they're fictional. but. Um, still kind of fun, cute, and flirty that uh, Christianity was trying to tie themselves to, to this kind of thing that early on. Um, as time went on, people still studied the Stoics. A lot of their writings were um, kind of part of the educational coursework in the Middle Ages. And then in the 16th and 17th century CE, Neo-Stoicism Neo was born from a good friend, Lipsius. Uh, he tried to tie it to Christianity one more time. Um, it kind of worked a little bit better this time. And um, it kind of stuck in the 17th century up until um, kind of the Enlightenment era, era in the 18th century. It was kind of like mm -hmm, amorphously engaged with that. But it regained traction back in the 20th century with Albert Ellis's use in his psychotherapy. So virtue ethics really um, did a really good job of uh, kind of encapsulating his worldview for cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. I don't know if you guys have heard of it, but um, it's pretty cool. Essentially changing your disposition in order to affect the world around you. Um, looking at tragedies as events that you cannot change, um, focusing on that which you can, which is yourself and how you view those tragedies. But um, Albert Ellis it really brought it back into the, the fold. Um, and it's kind of stuck as modern stoicism since then. Chris, are you sharing your PowerPoint? Did I forget again? Even after you guys told me to. Yeah, he did. Also, are you recording? I am recording. Oh, so now people will okay. see shame. That's great. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Ah! You one of these days I'm going to lose my mind and y'all will all be there. So this is the slide that I was supposed to be sharing. A little bit frazzled, don't worry about it. Um, you guys can read through it. It's essentially what I just said. Give you a second more, moving on. So the modern Stoic movement is um, not my favorite, but it's not the worst of modern Stoic ideals. Uh, most of their stuff is taken directly from the Enchiridion of Epictetus, um, Marcus Aurelius's meditations, and like select works of Seneca, not the totality of his extant letters, but like a few of them. They really do a lot of picking and choosing with this one. Um, the central tenet being, it's not the events that upset us, but our judgments about the events. So yet again, that central ideal of cognitive behavioral therapy, um, maintaining that you only have impact on what you can change. Don't worry about the things that you can't. So in that, there are a few publications that I've been subscribed to for now a year. Um, the New Stoa, Modern Stoic. And um, they frequently just put out essays that are a little bit silly. Um, not particularly bad, but they do a lot of misreading of the classics. Um, cutting off passages halfway through so that they can kind of use the second half of the passage as like the modern spin, but it was, it was already written. Um, one of my favorites was, uh, if you guys remember discussing um, ontology at the beginning of this, this PowerPoint, um, they, they talked about, you know, having something as the primary classification of things, 
But then they say that uh, the classics had like a binary view of things that were incorporeal and corporeal. And they presented the third and final um, uh, things that don't exist, but are something as if it was um, their brand new research, this whole new development in uh, Stoic philosophy. And that's just simply not true. Um, I don't know if it's on account of um, either knowing the classics really well and then misinterpret or purposefully mispresenting them so that they can like have that little edge or if it's just from a place of ignorance, um, having not actually read it and only having the first part of a passage. But um, either way, it's kind of problematic to uh, present ancient ideals as your own. That feels a little bit plagiarism-y. Um, moving on to Silicon Valley Stoicism, uh, Silicon Valley is really quite good at taking um, philosophies of other cultures and then incorporating them for like two years and then breaking off with them. We've seen this with Zen Buddhism, we've seen it with um, Shinto Buddhism, now we're seeing it with Stoicism, which to be fair have a few similarities that you could probably make, but still, come on guys, like, find a philosophy and stick to it, I guess. Um, not to say that you have to, you know, stick to your guns on anything, but still uh, abandoning a philosophy in search of another one that says essentially the same thing is a little bit icky. Um, not to say that that's a misappropriation at all. It's just something that I have a personal problem with. And finally, we have plenty of publications such as become an F withable um, with the help of these ancient philosophers. Um, 21 quotes from Marcus Aurelius that you can use to bolster yourself, that kind of thing. Um, and those are all over uh, kind of like, what is it? It's flash philosophy. Is that it? Pop philosophy, that's it. Um, where people are now re-remembering the Stoics, but as people that you couldn't mess with because they had emotional stability and the, the righteousness on their side, which like, I get, uh, they were pretty cool, but uh, not my fave. Um, do we have any questions about the modern Stoic movement? It's pretty heavily flavored by my distaste, but they're okay. I had a question about um, with the early so or rather the early Christians uh, trying to connect with Stoicism. Do you think they were trying to legitimize Christianity or what, what was their uh, rationale for it? I think definitely some of them were. Um, some of them were also just seeing things that resembled their own thoughts and ethical patterns and then um, kind of driving it to its logical conclusion and uh, saying that ideas can't come from two different people so it had to come from the same. Um, I would say that the dozens of people that tried to lay the claim that Seneca's bath or Seneca's bathtub death scene was a hidden baptism. They were trying to do something a little bit shady um, in uh, just establishing their legit legitimacy. But um, I don't know if that was everyone's intention. But I mean, it's really difficult looking at historiography and driving a hard line into what was the intent of everyone in a single movement? Does that answer your question or was that like a cheap way out? No, 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 that no, it did. It did. It just, uh, yeah, it, it kind of struck me that, um, you know, early Christians saw stoicism as, um, you know, a, an inroad, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, you know, they, they definitely wanted to uh, hop on the bandwagon to an extent. Um, but I mean, I like the idea that of course you can have the same idea from different sources. I mean, that's, you know, definitely something when you start studying various religions. And you have, to, we have to recognize that they were a minority group that had, um, one thing in common with people that were sort of on the fringe of the rest of philosophy. Um, so of course they wanted to like have that power in numbers maybe, but well, not of course, maybe, but. 
it's definitely one path which that they went down. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Speaking yeah. in circles, but such is life. Yeah. Um, Thank you. No problem, no. This is where we get into the misappropriation of the classics. So um, there's this absolutely horrendous publication called the Stoic School. And they have put forth a lot of, um, I don't want to say conspiracy theories. So I will say um, alternate histories on their website concerning um, how Stoic philosophy is somehow this, this underground tying feature from antiquity up until today that um, maintains a social order that is now failing in modern day America, question mark. Uh, it's truly bizarre if you want to read into it, but um, they have done something which I have particular issue with by um, writing under pseudonyms that are directly out of history books, such as Cato Udikensis, um, Cato the Elder, who wrote Coexistence Failures for 250 Years, which is um, a real cute little article about how um, the, the social position of women in America betrays a fundamental lacking in philosophical understanding, which is, yeah, yeah, you guys recognize why that's a problem. Um, this guy, Marcus Aurelius, did a part two apparently to meditations after 1500 some odd years and wrote about how the vice president is underutilized. This was in 2009, so discussing Joe Biden. But um, just truly bizarre. Um, they don't actually uh, use much of the Stoic philosophy beyond the name. So they, they throw in maybe sentence fragments from works or um, maybe even whole sentences if you're lucky. But in doing so, they have this like weird intention of bolstering an argument that has no legs. Um, and that's, that's what I take particular issue with, with the modern misappropriation of the classics. Um, misrepresenting the, the words of, you know, the ancients as if they were, they were meant to be used today. Um, intentionally misreading, intentionally um, putting forth incorrect ideals concerning their beliefs. Um, it's yucky. And that's, that's the point of this paper is to, to introduce what truly is classical stoicism and then discussing how it is different from these people. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think yes. it's good. I think it's good to talk about how you can't just read something and take it for what it is. You need to, uh, you know, do a little more research or see what, what is the point of them putting this article out, right? Who's writing it? What is their um, background? And that's, that's a major part of the issue is they're writing under pseudonyms. So it's nearly impossible to figure out who they are as individuals rather than, um, just reading directly their words and trying to infer from that. Um, I mean, it's very clear that they're white supremacists and they um, are incredibly misogynistic in their writings. So one would assume that they are on the American right. I don't know that off the top of my head, um, but I assume that they're not academics, but they, they have a couple of Funky things to say about the classics. Um, but the major issue is that I can't research their qualifications or recognize who they are as individuals. Which is great if um, it means that I can't use ad hominem attacks as a manner of arguing against them. So I have to engage directly with their works, but um, it does make it a little bit more difficult to, to discredit them. Anyways, there are a few issues that I am starting to wrap my head around. Um, 
which is obviously gatekeeping while maintaining a standard for um, classical research. So uh, we don't want to keep stoicism within the halls of academia because what purpose does it serve if it doesn't make it its way out? So um, the modern stoicism, that's why I say that they're okay. They, they're not the greatest, but they're okay. They, they represent stoics. They engage in their original texts. They might do it in such a way that betrays the idea that they're like somehow cleverer or have thought more in depth about it. Um, I think that's a little bit problematic, but I do think that they have the right idea with going forth, um, recognizing the works of the classics as being their own. Um, but we do have to maintain that standard of um, reading a work in not its entirety, but in such a way that you recognize where it's coming from and what it's actually meant to be saying um, and presenting it in that light. Uh, we don't, it's, it's a weird line to, to draw in, in research um, to, to make sure that the common man has access to real uh, analysis of stoicism and a, an ability to engage with it in such a way that they can they can get the fundamental ideals out of it without having to wade through like all the jargon that you guys just had to. So um, let's make this a brief discussion. How do you guys feel about that? Feel about what, what exactly? Um, are you asking like how we feel about the misappropriation of ancient stoicism in modern stoicism or something uh, along those lines? That and how do we go about uh, maintaining a standard in the classical community without making it gatekeeping, without preventing people that don't have like a very specified subset of knowledge to engage in these works? What's, what's the move? The best way to probably go about that would be um, unbiased, documented research of simple, just simplified the work, the works of ancient stoicism, uh, where instead of having piecemeal uh, interpretations of only some sentences or words or passages, uh, it's the whole thing summarized and condensed in a more academic standard. I like it. Good plan. Does anyone we'll say there are there are a, a fair number of classicists that are tackling these issues. Um, you know, I, I've been to a couple of lectures uh, where they discuss how, you know, the when we look at the past, when we look at the um, writings and everything, uh, we need to remember that you know the Romans are biased. Right, and so they are, are writing from a certain perspective, and we need to make sure that we recognize those biases and uh, how they are influencing their own writings. And so, you know, I, I from what you're saying about the misappropriation, um, you know, it sounds like it sounds like sometimes uh, modern Stoics are, are taking the writings um, at face value and just running with it without processing and thinking about it. And there's definitely a movement within the classics community to really analyze and really, you know, hold the light up to the Romans and, and recognize, um, you know, they weren't, they weren't all good, you know, <laughs> and, and that's okay. We can still study them and we can still talk about how they influence modern society and all of that. Uh, but, uh, you know, we shouldn't um, put them on this pedestal where we can't, um, you know, see the fractures. For sure, definitely.